Sandy was instrumental in making my favorite rock band, the Blue Oyster Cult, the apex of smart, weird, spooky, hooky rock. He was also a founding VP of eMusic and has worked with an early recommendation engine for digital music called Mood Agent. He's done tons of other stuff too. I would tell you to go to his Wikipedia page, but apparently it's under contention for its accuracy. So if you have any questions about Sandy's actual CV, you should probably hit him up after our conversation. Sandy has been bringing the bad news that nobody wants to hear forever. And I've always found that, and he might take issue with this characterization, that there's a grain of optimism in even his most dire pronouncements. For example, Sandy's theory of the paradise of infinite storage where collapsing costs of storage and compression technology for digital audio means that all the music ever recorded can fit on something as small as a guitar pick. And of course, that would be shareable. Now this would obviously frustrate anti-piracy efforts and efforts around uh, compensation for artists and rights holders, but note that he calls it a paradise because there may be a social good in all that access, although he would readily admit that musicians and the benefit to musicians may not be immediately discernible. Sandy also came up with the five cent solution, which years ago aimed to arrive at a price point for music online that consumers would be willing to pay, and that would have, at least according to his numbers, created a huge influx of cash into an ailing industry. That idea did not fly with rights holders back in the day, but how crazy is it in a world where we're now talking about fractions of pennies per stream? Sandy also spoke very early and often about the vinyl resurgence as a potential bright spot for the music industry. Now, we know that this is unlikely to return <clears throat> the music industry to its previous lofty economic position, but it is a growing segment of recorded music sales, and it doesn't seem to be going away, even as new digital platforms come along. So that doesn't sound completely apocalyptic. As a recording engineer, Sandy also understands format. He knows about the importance of cultural preservation. In fact, he works with the Library of Congress on identifying recorded music of nat national cultural significance. Sandy's been talking about these issues at conferences since I think the very first music conference was held in a cave in Mesopotamia. Uh, I believe that the big debate back then was how many pelts a crude guttural sound was worth. Sandy and I have uh, actually done the, a version of this show at other conferences. This is the very first time that we've had this conversation on my home turf here at FMC. So maybe you can think of this interview as something along the lines of Anakin Skywalker interviewing Emperor Palpatine, except the dark side is maybe actually not so dark. Wow, that's too confusing. Well, uh, do you want to sit at the table? Open mine. Then what are we going to do with this? Inch max we have ghost chairs. So Santa brought um, some high-powered computational devices. Only two. Only, only two of them. It's necessary for our purposes today. Okay. Well. You got your microphone? Yeah. You got your paper? Is it picking me up? Can I please the there? No, you have to hold it. Oh man, I don't know. Can you help? I can go like this, watch. Cool. This is what I do for people. <laughs> this is how far I'm willing to go. Let's open this one. Okay. Keep on talking. I'm gonna keep on talking. Sandy, we've all gone over so many times how the music industry is messed up. Yeah. Right? Yeah. But it does seem to be rebuilding itself to some extent, but there's a tremendous lack of confidence about whether the new version will benefit musicians on any level. And as a matter of fact, we talked about that yesterday so much that I, I'm sure that uh, I felt my head was going to explode, and, uh, and, and I'm sure that the, some of the audience did as well. But people keep making music. Anyway, why do they do that? Because they like doing it. But why? We hear so much about the, the idea that this is only a... A, a, an opportunity for people to, uh, to to make money. Like, is money the, the primary driver? Should it be the primary driver? Absolutely not. Although it'd be great if musicians were paid for what they do. Why is it? Why why is it great? Oh, uh, because you know they have to pay for their guitars, their amps, their acoustic, Steinways, 
You know, they're housing buffers, they have homes, I could go on. Mm -hmm. And also the industry that I was very fond of, that I grew up with, that uh, the records that I listened to benefited from a massive backline of specialized skills, talents, and people pursuing uh, you know, vocations within this music industry that might not have even been about the performer or the songwriter. And you are, were a beneficiary of that system as well. Uh, is it a loss to our culture if that goes away? Absolutely a loss to our culture, but it's not necessarily the case it's going away. You know, against all odds and all reasonable expectation, how many tens of thousands of people are being taught in recording arts academies these days? Uh, you know, it's a shame that they have no snake to teach them, but still, you know, there is a super quantity of people who are being educated. But where do they go after their education, I guess is the question. I mean, you've got the big student loans and you've learned all of these valuable skills and you want to get out there and make some use of them. Maybe uh, you don't expect to, to uh, live uh, high off the fatty calf, but you, you want to be able to do the things that you got to do. I like, I like that fatty calf uh, reference. Well, you know, first of all, there are a few places they can work at. I mean, some uh, records are still being, recordings are still being made by uh, professionally qualified engineers and producers. Um, one place that really, one sphere of the of the semi-music business is gaming, and that sphere has actually begun to get out of the box and stop making uh, scores exclusively or mainly on an in-the-box basis, uh, and has begun to go back and record at least real analog instruments, if Same not on, if not on, yes, sure. It's been a real payday for Eastern European symphonic, uh, symphony orchestras. It'll work for almost nothing. So if you are the music director of the Sofia uh, Philharmonic or the Bucharest Philharmonic or something like that, you, you know, it's been okay for you. <laughs> so why, why do you think the video game designers find uh, the analog uh, expression more attractive, even though they're creating these things that are ostensibly an, a, the example of the ultimate digital cultural art. Well, I actually have to know quite a few people working this sphere of the semi-music business. You know, they have decided that uh, recording and generating music totally in the box actually uh, creates an impoverished experience, which is not as attractive or sticky or engaging, you know, as, uh, as you know, recording real uh, musicians. So when we're talking about in the box, we're talking about, uh, you know, generating sound, mixing records, um, mastering records, all within a computer, uh, with probably uh, fewer and fewer <coughs> analog instruments or uh, having the digital signal path replace the old analog signal path. So that's, well, well not, not entirely true because there is also a huge and burgeoning market uh, in the uh, development and uh, manufacturing sale of uh, Analog signal processing gear that can get somewhere into this chain, you know, of even originally digit, uh, the re, uh, original. Oh, I think that works not work here. Uh, of, a, of, a, of music objects originally recorded on a digital basis. So, you know, you can loop the stuff out through the analog outputs uh, and that work with the stuff in the analog domain and then send it back to hell. Is that a and market? Is, is there a market for that? Because when you hang around with enough engineers all the time, you, some, you occasionally hear them actually laugh about the idea of selling MP3s or even making money off streams because why would anyone want to buy it? It sounds like crap. Well, are there any, is there anybody here who is in the engineering, producing, or professional audio universe? Raise your hands, don't be ashamed. Okay, so you read, you read tape up? Yeah. All right, I read nothing but tape. Um, yes. Do you read mix? Yeah. I mean, I'm, you know, whatever, professional audio digest, whatever it's called, PAD, et cetera. Well, I think you'll find, I mean, I think you will verify that the action is mainly uh, these days in, uh, in analog gear, often a reproduction of a classic circuitry of the 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s. Uh, I just noticed that one of my favorite pieces of equipment, the uh, analog and digital ADR uh, compacts compressor and dual noise gate is now back. An incredibly unreliable piece of equipment. I know many of them just like so the floor. <laughs> but uh, but uh, it certainly was the key to the sound sound of many of my records, including a given enough rope. And when I was out on the road mixing the clash, 
And I brought along a bunch of API 560 graphic equalizers and, uh, and one of these A&R uh, A &D uh, compressors. Uh, when I had to go home after making the show at the uh, Santa Monica Civic Center, you know, Mick Jones said to me, I'm trying to reproduce his accent, boy, Sandy, go taking out a guitar sound film with you, aren't you? <laughs> and the answer was yes, I was taking the guitar sound home with me, even though Judge Sturman, who not, was not a technological determinist, you know, contested that later. But, you know, Mick was a keen observer of the recording so process. We're, see we're seeing a need for, you know, people are relating <laughs> to, to analog sound in some way, shape, or form, but there, the flip side of that coin is that, you know, all of this stuff gets digitally crunched and massively distributed. Uh, and I was wondering if you could tell us about uh, your latest um, theory or, or, or brain scramble, the transfinite music library. Like, when we hear library, we think of still to this day, or at least I do, places that people go to be lent informational or cultural artifacts. But what you're describing is way, 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 way bigger. So what is the, the Transfinite Finite Music Library, and how does it relate to, say, the Paradise of Infinite Story? OK. Any studies of Hellenistic history in the room? <laughs> or, wait, or Middle Roman history in the room? Come on, it must be somebody. It's Georgetown. OK. So we all know about the great city of Alexandria. Uh, it was founded by Alexander the Great, and it's a great city. Uh, and uh, has anybody here seen the movie Agora? Unbelievable. I know, he asked me that earlier, and I kind of hung my head in shame. Are there no racial vice, wise fanatics in this room? I knew a, a I racial vice fanatic who was not in this room. It's embarrassing. So anyway, um, in, the, in the great city of Alexandria was the great library of Alexandria, uh, one of the, you know, cultural nexuses of, of, the, of the ancient world. And uh, this supposedly inferior had the largest collection of books and papyri and scrolls, etc., uh, ever assembled in one place. It was burnt, depending on who you blame, either the Romans, the early Christians, or a bomb. Well, I was about to get at that. Or by, or by the Arab invaders of of Alexandria. So you have a choice of three potential villains, or maybe they all took turns burning at, at different times. Uh, so I kind of like to think about that as a great example to all of us of how much could be assembled in one place, even if they were linear artifacts uh, on you know which existed in a physical state. So the transfinite, transfinite musical library contains all of the recordings ever made anywhere at any time in the history of the world. Well, this was all impossible, and, no way, and in no way could this have been assembled before the internet. So now, virtually every recording, recording ever made anywhere at any time on any recording platform uh, in the 100 and, uh, oh, it's about 150 plus years history of sound recording, uh, most of it analog, uh, all of these are available, literally, from the first. Leon Scott and Martin D's recording of Eau Claire de la Lune, which has just been uh, uh, translated into a hearable form. Yeah, uh, that's a fascinating. By, uh, you know, fun as a function of the Irene device, which was mainly invented by uh, three engineers or three scientists at the uh, Lawrence Berkeley Laboratory. And also, there was some input from the Library of Congress, my friends there. And in fact, uh, Haber, who is the principal scientist, uh, the principal responsible party for this device, uh, just received the MacArthur Award for his work. Anyway, so they were able to read and translate into audible form the sound recordings, recordings of the music that Leon Scott de Martin D made in 1859 through 1861. His recording platform was, was an analog platform. It, uh, he recorded on sheets of sooty paper, lamp black paper, and uh, he recorded using a kind of very, very, very early microphone, which drove the stylus, which inscribed the waveforms on the sheets of paper. This is really a marvelous way to record. It's, a, it's like a, it's almost, if you can picture it in your mind, it's like an etching. Yeah. Uh, that carries sound, and it's it's hard to even consider what that means. But I've 
the, the recording is available online and you can hear it and it's quite beautiful and the story is really interesting. It, it contains uh, in, its, in, its, um, in its narrative, in its history, like a ghostly yes. artifact that um, I think uh, it actually makes the, what's captured in that audio etching even more special when you know the story. But Sandy, there's a lot of, you say that the Transfinite Music Library has everything from that point all the way to you know, potentially infinity, but we do know that there's a ton of cultural works that haven't been properly digitized or that uh, represent significant hurdles to preservation and not everyone has uh, the ability to get a MacArthur grant to use the latest technology to do that. So can you tell us a little bit of, uh, about your work at Library of Congress, which again, is not a particularly nihilistic uh, thing to do? Yeah, well, I, I want to go back, I want to backspace a few commas uh, and, and add this. Um, there is really a great deal of proactive work being done by the population at large. You know, um, in the preservation effort to preserve our patrimony, our sound patrimony, at least. Uh, there are sociopathic uploaders. There are uploaders who you know, feel they are serving the greater good by uploading. Uh, even, you know, people who are merely pirates are often unloading, uh, uploading uh, recordings that really nobody would know about unless they had uploaded them. For example, I. Uh, I teach a course, or I used to teach a course at McGill University uh, called the uh, Philosophy and Aesthetics of, uh, of Music Production. And uh, I assigned four, excuse me, I assigned four, five assignments a semester, uh, which I, and I reported that they write five papers for me a semester. One of them a long paper, the other one no more than seven or eight pages long. And one of my students, um, came up to me and really wanted to write about uh, Don McLean's, not American Pie, but Vincent. Okay, so I said, normally, I would not want to hear Don McLean, Vincent. <laughs> but, you know, okay, I'll give you a shot. And I did a little research, and I found some uploads. Uh, in this case, they hadn't even reached YouTube, which we will get to. But they were merely on, you know, a bunch of big farms. And people had actually gone to trouble of uploading Tori Amos, singing Vincent. This was actually a really interesting interpretation of the song. So this kid, uh, who's a real smart guy, had actually wrote me a paper on uh, quantum acute recording and, and, you know, and the possibility of actually getting to some recording process that would exceed analog in its quality, uh, he you know, went and found some recordings of Vincent. Uh, I gave him Tori Amos's recording. And one of the things that I do in my classes is, is that uh, I practice what a friend of mine, recently deceased, unfortunately, uh, Professor Fred Weidman at UC Santa Cruz. You know, it's odd that somebody would be in paradise and then die. You know, really, if you're teaching UC Santa Cruz, you should live forever just, you know, <laughs> just, you know to, just to like consort with the pelican, pelicans and, you know, the surfers and all the rest of the stuff that happens there in paradise. Um, and he is well known as the Grateful Dead Professor. Yeah. Yeah, he had a huge number of students slash acolytes. Uh, you know, he was, his classes, took place in an auditorium that held 500 people, and they, there were always 200 people standing and sitting and violating the fire laws in these auditoriums. And anyway, a good guy, a really good guy, a real, a real shame, you know, that he has moved on to another venue. Uh, but he described what I do as uh, recording-based musicology. And that's because there is no definitive recording or performance of anything. And the more performances that you expose people to, the more information that they are able to internalize about what the what was the potentiality of what the composer, you know, had had created originally. The the work is not solely described by its score, nor is it solely described by any recording of it, nor is it solely described by a recording you know, made, conducted by the composer with his own private orchestra, which Stravinsky, for example, had the privilege of doing 
for Colombia. It's really, it's it, was, it unfolds all or mo most or more of its potential information in the multifaceted recording you're recording that way it's like linguistics as well because like you have you know because of the length of time that it would take for all of these expressions or impressions of music to exist uh, and cross pollinate and expand uh, you know it doesn't look like a full sentence or a paragraph but if you have the benefit of time and the right equipment and the ability to uh, you know sort of navigate that space in, a, in an ethnomusicological way as well as a you know a, a um, an engineering way, then yeah. you can discern a new linguistics from this, this uh, transfer. Yeah, actually, interesting. Fred Wigman was an ethnomusicologist. He created the departments at Brown, no great shapes, but he also created the department of the University of Washington, which is like really so, an important important department. And then got recruited to Santa Cruz uh, and moved from from Seattle, which I think is almost paradise. You know, it's a real paradise down there in Santa Cruz. Well, let's talk about let's talk about like what what happens when say the Library of Congress is, is doing its selection uh, process to figure out what is an important uh, cultural work, audio work, or recorded work in the United States. Hattie Smith's horses, for example. Tell us about how that came to be recognized. Sure, uh, I'm an old buddy of Hattie's, and uh, in fact, I will before I embark upon this, you can bring me back okay. to the main theme anytime you like, except when I don't We had a theme, wait. <laughs> Unless I don't want to go back there. But um, I was going to say that apropos of this recording-based musicology, you really haven't lived until you've gone through the entire corpus of Land of a Thousand Dances. <laughs> you went? Wow. Oh, that sounds great. Yeah. I mean, first of all, Land of a Thousand Dances has so much to tell us in the fantastic recording uh, of Cannibal and the Headhunters about the Chicano music scene in LA and how it developed, uh, the original recordings, uh, the New Orleans recordings being New Orleans, have so much to tell us about you know what things were like in the in the New Orleans scene in the mid-60s. Uh, and Patty Smith's recording has so much to tell us about nothing so much as the power and the extent of the human imagination when it is wielded by a weapon, as, as a weapon by somebody with infinite courage and infinite intelligence. I, I gave a speech in honor of Patty Smith at the Riot Girl Conference in Seattle. Girl Conference in Seattle. I was there. Was it a good speech? It was fantastic. RFO, which means right effing on. So, oh, yeah. <laughs> culturally, culturally, culturally ignorant. Uh, and, uh, and I just counted the way, the ways in which Patty Smith was like kind of operating at such an exalted level that it was almost unfair to turn her loose because, you know, once she got a shot at the big time, you know, she got there in a very strange and and winding, taffy kind of kind of way. So um, now, if you want to, it, we'll roll me back in. Yeah, I mean gently. Uh, so we know that. Roll me back in. We know that uh, horses is, is very significant. I, I think oh, right. So many of us feel that, like just as music fans. Um, but you know, we're talking about the Library of Congress. Yeah. Everybody imagines this as being like some sort of stuffy federal. Uh, something or other. And it is. Yeah. So here is, are there any members, are there any people who work for the library here? I'm glad we could confirm that. Right. No? All right. There are no people here on the National Recording Preservation Board of the Library of Congress? Yeah, you can talk shit now, Sandy. All right. Well, I'm not. <laughs> I'm just kidding. So, uh, I am. And uh, a couple of years ago, I guess I got there three years ago, uh, really because of the FMC. They had a slot on the National Recording Preservation Board which was occupied by this, uh, the you know, former executive director of, of Sainted Memory, Jenny Toomey, also known as L'Orange, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Okay, and uh, when L'Orange moved on to the Ford Foundation, just as Ford was getting out of, you know, the valley of near bankruptcy, uh, somebody, had, they needed to put somebody else or just lose the position and have no fanatic musician's advocate <laughs> on the board. So they put me on, <laughs> for that in all senses, all senses of the word. And uh, so I got there, and we have a nomination process where we nominate 
uh, the Limited Body Awards a recording every year uh, that we want to see um, preserved using the best technology available right now, which might be the last time, which may also be the technology on which these recordings are preserved for it should be or as long as our civilization persists. And so everybody was given an opportunity to get up if they wanted to and make a speech supporting the the nomination of some recording to be preserved for as long as our civilization shall persist. And so I got up and talked about somebody that virtually nobody there had ever heard of. And her name was Patty Smith. And I talked about horses and what uh, like a, a form buster this was, you know, how, how the French poetry of the late 19th century had invaded, you know, you know, the rock and roll of the late 20th century, how this had been an inspiration, not only to music lovers everywhere, but to women, you know, everywhere who wanted, you know, to make their own path, you know, and do what they wanted to do in the music business, for lack of a better pejorative term, uh, et cetera. And like, somehow I got through to them. And it was nominated and, and, and it was voted in uh, by, by, the, uh, by the committee, uh, and then approved by the Water of Congress. So I said, wow, this is pretty cool. Yeah. So next year, I got up and made a speech about, well, first of all, does anybody know the band Love? Yes. All right, raise your hands, I just want to say. Absolutely. Not so bad. And we all know Arthur Lee, those of us who know the Absolutely. band Love. So I have always claimed, and I wrote many articles about love when I was a music writer, uh, about how amazing Forever Changes was and is. And uh, so I got up and made a speech about Forever Changes, and I just thought this was going right by. But strangely enough, they didn't even bother tell me. You know, I didn't even know it had been voted in. You know, and approved by the Library of Congress. I do remember when I said that many of the members of, of the band had spent a lot of time in jail, yep. and that the one member who hadn't spent any time in jail, Brian McLean, had been uh, Liza Minnelli's boyfriend. Uh, you, can, you can deal with it any way you want. He, he was such a handsome dude that bands in LA were competing to make him their roadie you know, before he joined Love, you know, because he had his own following girl following, and they would come just to bask in his Apollonian glory, you know, even if it wasn't playing. But Love was smart enough, Arkley was smart enough, you know, to incorporate him in his band, and he wrote some of the best songs. He died young, unfortunately. I remember once I had an interview, I was going to interview him, and he said, hmm, I can't do the interview this week, and I have to be out of Southampton, you know, to hang out with uh, Wise. I said, no problem, I'm with me there. I'll just drive over. You know, I'll bring some blueberry pie from uh, whatever the name of that bakery is. <laughs> Not native to the Eastern Long Island, you wouldn't have. Brian Bear Farms, for those who want to know where the good blueberry pie is. And we can talk anyway out there on the beach. So we did. I did the interview on the beach out there in South Bay. Yeah, I neglected to mention that Sandy is also one of, um, I don't know, the, the, the initial three or four rock music writers ever uh, on the planet Earth. So that's kind of fascinating too. Uh, you wield a, a terrible and fearsome power at the Library of Congress, obviously. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you could well, you I'm, virtually I'm name any record and well, then see I'm, 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 I'm pushing now for John Osborne's yeah. Grateful, uh, which, do you guys know anything about this? Who knows this record? What's the record? Grateful. Yeah. You do, okay. Are there any deadheads in this room? Wow, this is disturbing. <laughs> I was Jerry has only been gone for 18 years, and yet the cult is fine. Is, is unraveling. I, I don't want to believe. I was going to raise my hand, but I, I didn't want it to damage my reputation. Anymore. Yeah. So anyway, and Twitter right, does. John Oswald is a uh, musician and computer scientist of a sort, who uh, was one of the first people to be sued by the RAAA and by the Michael Jackson legal army, when he uh, created these unauthorized mashups of all sorts of works, including, uh, I, I can't remember, you know, the you know the recording that he committed to the, the Steely Dan, uh, Billie Jean one, did he? No. Uh, but I can't remember which recording he created sacrilege against, 
but the uh, Jackson Whig Army was right there. Uh, but he had also done some authorized uh, sacrilege uh, as, a, as a hireling of Electra Records, which still somehow was drawing on the illusion that the great genius Jack Holtzman, Holtzman was still there, and that they're, they're, you know, they had some sort of residual mission to enlighten humanity as to what great music was. So anyway, uh, David Gans, this is the name maybe, all right, to the few deadheads in the room, uh, knew Oswald, knew his work, and brought the work to the attention of Jerry and Phil. That is Jerry Garcia and Phil Lash for whatever. <laughs> and uh, for those who don't know, which is almost everybody here. And, uh, and they just loved what, uh, what Oswald had done. So they did something very unusual. They gave him access to all 230 odd recordings that had been made by the tapers, or the, the tapers as in you know, the semi-official dead tapers, or the non-official dead, dead tapers, and by themselves in the studio, and their official outtakes for their live recording uh, sessions, etc. They gave them access to everything, mainly stuff on the, done by the tapers. And uh, he was not everything, which believe me, around the corner from where I have my recording studio in San Rafael, California, or as I like to say, in the shadow of the Wookiee, because mm -hmm. just down yes. the road from Lucasfilm. So, uh, so they, um, they let him listen to everything. He listened to all the stuff, quite an investment in the love for the music. And he picked out 120, which he went back to Toronto. Uh, and um, he turned this into a two-hour version of the song Dark Star, recorded over about 30 years with layers of recordings from all sorts of times and places stacked up in an incredibly saturated sponge, you know, sponge stack of musical events and sonic events. And he did this all in the early 90s before this technology existed. Yeah. And he invented the digital technology necessary to do this. <laughs> and, uh, and there it was. And to the credit of Canada, it is platinum in Canada. And to the discredit of the United States, it is not platinum in the United States. And uh, so my latest campaign is to get gray folded, mm -hmm. uh, incorporated either as a classical composition or rock <coughs> event, or as a technology exercise into the uh, uh, permanent collection of the Library of Congress. That would be the ultimate too. I think it's interesting, like that's a type of fractal music. And when you think about, you know, fractals and closing your eyes when you're tripping balls at a Grateful Dead concert, I mean, you can actually represent that with audio. That's fascinating. And along the lines of your profound analysis, I gave, I, I gave a copy of this. So when Fred Sonic Smith died and Patti Smith returned to, I don't want to say the music business, but for recording again. She came back to New York. She borrowed the house in the West Village of a music meta executive. This house had a big kind of living fireplace. And uh, I gave her a, a copy of uh, Grey Folded. And she and the band turned off the lights, lit up the candles, put some logs on the fire, and listened to Grey Folded before they went in to record her return. That's awesome. Her return to music. So here we are. So not only that was cool, but it also was like there were people in the room when she recorded who had not been together, you know, for 20 years, 25 years. So as I walked in there one night while they were recording, I said, God, these people really, I thought they would never be reassembled in one time and one place, but so great is the magic of Patti Smith that she, she would pick hard like she made it so. That's pretty powerful. I think that uh, I, w I want to touch on one, one last thing while we have the time to talk about it. You know, a lot of this is real. All these are stories, and we don't even get to discuss the series. No, the stories are better than the oh, series. Oh, man, no. What theories are better? But I think that what we're, what we're trying to establish here is the idea that there's, an, an, you know, infinite recombinations of musical expression, that there is a reason that music exists that touches people, that there are technologies that can enhance the ability to access that music in new and interesting ways, or even in the case of Grateful, to assemble it in new and interesting ways. So it takes on uh, an additional life beyond what were the notes on well, paper or the uh, or origin, originating well, what, performance. What he did, what Oswald did, was create in one two-disc instantiation 
a completely authentic, transfinite experience. There is no way to really describe the amount of information contained on these disks. Not only is there so much stuff stacked up, so recordings made from the fantastic SUNY Albany, or SUNY Binghamton, or Stony Brook, you know, dead performances, and performances made at the closing of Winterland, and performances made, you know, in the original, the original film war on, on Geary Street for those who this bring back, brings back hours, even though it might have been just minutes in real time. That's you a know, trigger a word. A hyper experience. Right. <laughs> Flashback. Flashback. Exactly. I was not there. Right. Um, I was there, though. There, but the other side of this is that the hobgoblin of digital, uh, and we've been at every single conference on the planet basically talking about this for a long, well, you've been doing it forever, but uh, is, is monetization or money, somebody making money, somebody's got to make money, somebody uh, is making money, who's making money, where's the money going, and you have a, a new theory, uh, the theory of the evil privilege, and, and I wonder who they are and what makes them so evil, because that's kind of a harsh word. Uh, as far as I can tell, you're talking about pipe, which is the infrastructure of the internet, the backbone, the delivery system of the internet, your internet service providers, uh, a ISP service layer, and yeah, telcos, exactly, a service layer uh, or, a, or or a platform layer, which would be you know everything from search engines to you know YouTube to Spotify to anything that delivers the content to people, and then of course the content itself, which at the end of the day, if you're going to make money off it, is owned by somebody who wants to exploit. Uh, those rights for profit. So are those the three triplets? They are. I describe it as a kind of investment non-Venn diagram. Uh, and what I mean by that is that one layer gets, I don't want to say all, because technically that would, excuse me, one layer makes all the money, or virtually all the money, and that's the backbone, the, the carriage providers, as I like to put it, but it, it sounds a little too friendly as a 19th century ring to really 22nd century totalitarianism, totalitarianism, as we have come to learn even here in the 21st century. Okay, so there's the carriage layer. You're talking about the digital panopticon? Uh, right on, RFO. And then, <laughs> there is the, then there is the layer of mainly occupied by streaming services, which gets Let's forget about the investment made into the telcos, the ISPs, the fiber, you know, the fiber dudes, etc. That all makes sense because no matter what is going to be ha happening, whether it's happening, you know, on the part of the NSA or happening on the part of us, if different Jay Google from the NSA, but that's so silly. Uh, and naive. Uh, no matter what is happening, you know, that investment is going to be made. Uh, but the other big investment is made into a whole endless series of what I call greater and greatest fool enterprises. And these are, for the most part these days, streaming. Because even the biggest idiots, the greatest fools ever, have, have finally gotten the message that there is no data there in downloading. I mean, if iTunes, the music service, were to close down tomorrow, the impact on uh, Apple's bottom line would be immeasurably inconsequential. I'm trying to minimize it but as much as possible. I also have found no, no, no claim anywhere that any downloading service has ever made any money, including iTunes, when you can find it the music. Well, you know, they've, they've, they've collateralized, cross-collateralized their profits across a lot of different areas. I think everybody has to do that. Mainly the hire I'm going to ask a question real quick though. Well, well, let me finish. The point is, is that there is an enormous amount of investment being made mainly in streaming services. And here's another place that I, here's another example of an, of an enterprise, of a, a, a class of enterprises that I've been able to find no evidence of ever having made any money. No, zero. Nobody will claim it. I wonder why that is. Uh, and, uh, there's a lot of money available to finance these operations, but I'm not intelligent enough to understand why, and I don't really subscribe to conspiracy theorizing, especially in this regard. I just don't understand it. So I, I attribute it all to what I call a greater and greatest fool theory. I teach a course, I used to teach a course at McGill, and I will be teaching at the U of T, and also because I was given total license to kill by the good Dominican sisters of the Dominican University of California. They let me do anything. You know, I taught there for a semester, and I taught a seminar on this where I developed this entire body of theory. 
because I just want to rethink everything from, you know, from sub-ground zero. You know, I really wanted to just go back and think it, rethink it all, and abandon what I've been teaching you know, on the matrix that I employed in, in years gone by at McGill, for the benefit of my French-speaking students. One thing that, uh, that seems interesting to me is that you're calling them triplets. Uh, they're already pretty incestuous triplets. Uh, you've got uh, Comcast owning well, uh, NBC. You've got um, uh, the major labels with an equity uh, share in Spotify, which we talked about a bit yesterday. And you know you have other service layer providers uh, partnering with content providers and, and maybe even laying fiber in select cities. So it seems like there's a blur in this. In well, this well I don't know if we either of us finished the description of the investment right. situation. I think that's very important. So obviously, and the profit situation, obviously, the telcos, the backbone companies, the fiber addicts, et cetera, you know, are going to continually invest because they have to, absolutely have to, or they will come to a crashing halt. Uh, then there's this huge recurring investment in enterprises which show no sign. And by the way, even though you can't find any evidence that any of them made any money, you find lots of evidence that none of them can make any money. People have gone on record and said that this, you know, well, they keep shifting the goalpost for what the, where the money is supposed to go. Yeah. So, all right, so, but no profits. Many people believe, most people believe, no sign of any potential profit. But apparently you say that you can still make money off of something that, you know, obviously the, the music industry is paying some attention to because um, they have to diversify revenue. Fine. Yeah, well, the music industry does not invest in vinyl. How many people here are making, are commissioning the making of vinyl for themselves. It's really expensive though, isn't it, when you're doing it's it? It's only 350 pop total. It's not that expensive. Uh, are you selling it yourself? Yes. So I've had a couple of like, orgiastically revealing, you know, uh, uh, or orgiastically magnificent revelations about vinyl. For example, we all know, I hope, Patterson Hood, drive-by trucker dude, yeah. all right? So a few months ago, I went to see him in Mill Valley. <laughs> it's just like kidding me. But even, <laughs> to me, even to me, it's a joke, and I live up the road. Uh, so I like, you know, went to see him play in Mill Valley, and he had his table set up outside of Sweetwater, which is a legendary venue, who is performing as a solo artist without the 18 other guitarists in the, in the truckers. and. Um, so he was selling CDs, and he might have been selling download or, or download coupons, I don't know. Mm -hmm. I like to think he's too smart for that. <laughs> and, uh, but what was he really selling? T-shirts and all the usual stuff. But what was he selling Final. the most of? Five for Final. Final, $25 a pop, $3.50 to manufacture. Everything else, if you are selling it yourself, is yours. Now, one thing about vinyl is, the, is that the music industry has been slow to awaken as to how big this is, especially in terms of profit potential. So, like, artists are getting, you know, to make their own vinyl. It's not all profit. You do, I'm sure, have to pay the record company something, you know, for the rights to use these masters to make your vinyl. So I don't want to, I don't want to exaggerate too much. But it's still, it's an awful lot of money, depending on your deal. And um, I did a calculation once uh, that, let me see if I can just find this, because this is really a pretty- Find it quick, because we have to wrap up. We have an FCC Okay, here we go. The, house. the cost to manufacture a vinyl LP was 100 to 200 gram virgin vinyl. Stuff that the record companies had not used yet in an eternity. They wouldn't know virgin vinyl. I don't even want to finish mm -hmm. the statement. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, uh, therefore, each 100 billion vinyl LPs cost about $350, or $350 million to manufacture. It's a third of a billion dollars in North American nomenclature. Uh, assuming the wholesale cost of a vinyl LP, I'm including everything, and I'm really overstating this, is about $10, packaging, whatever. You know, uh, and I am overstating it. Therefore, uh, well, excuse me. Assuming the wholesale cost in a wholesale environment is $10, let's go back, let's cancel some of what I said. Uh, it's built into it, but 
anyway, and if you're selling this yourself, if this is your own private high level of vinyl, you know, you're not, you're not dealing with selling this to anybody on a wholesale. These, therefore, each 100 million vinyls, vinyl LPs sold at wholesale, which does not describe the situation where Bayons are actually vending the stuff themselves, uh, equals $1 billion in revenue. Remember, $1 billion equals $100 million. Therefore, each 100 million vinyl LPs sold equals $650 million in profit. Now, the total uh, in the, the total, the gross income of the music business, of the recorded music business, is now adjusted for inflation, although this is not as impressive when I say adjusted for inflation, because there's really been not much inflation in the last 15 years. It's been in food and cost of energy. Give us the number, man. Uh, well, anyway, the total, the total income, gross income of the music, recorded music business, is about $7 billion a year. Yeah. So that so, would represent, you know, a significant, a small, but like a, a not insignificant chunk of, of recorded music revenue. So we have to go. But I'm going to say that everything that we said here, including that, was incredibly hopeful and uplifting, right? We did our job. Well, the last, the last word is you could actually imagine, and I taught a course on this, an alternative vinyl economy that makes more money and certainly returns more of it to the artist than the entirety of the now deprived, depraved, and decadent conventional music business. Just something to think about. Yeah. And I hope you do. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.